welcome to week two of our um, study of the stories from the wilderness. And I'm so glad that you guys are all here on this rainy Tuesday night. Um, and glad y'all are here. So I'm going to just pray for us real quick because I always need to start with a little Jesus. Uh, Heavenly Father, thank you for today. And Lord, um, I know I say this a lot, but every time it rains, Lord, I am reminded of the verse in Isaiah that says that your um, word is like the rain, how it falls to the earth and it causes the bud to flourish and the plants to grow, and it does not return void, Lord, so your word goes forth from your mouth and it does not return without accomplishing the purpose that you have set forth. And so, Lord, as we have the physical reminder of what your word does, Lord, I pray that we would be refreshed by your word, that it would um, flourish and grow in us tonight, that what we hear would take root, and that it would change our lives, Lord, as we become more like you and um, reflect that into the world. And it's in your name I pray. Amen. Amen. Um, I am standing up here tonight, not standing in the promised land. Um, it's been a really hard day for me, um, and it started with me having to say goodbye to my best friend who's moving to the other side of the world and his um, plane took off literally 25 minutes ago. And um, so there have been many tears shed today as um, it has been a sweet time of having her here for the last five months. It's the longest we figured out, the longest we've lived in the same place um, since we were in high school. So it's been 20 and so what a gift it has been and so it was just a really hard start today but what god has continued to remind me is that the events of today have not been a surprise to him and that he knew when i said i would teach this week what was going to be happening in my life at this time and so um one of uh, the things i'm really passionate about is never standing up here and trying to pretend like i've got it all together and i'm standing in the promised land because i want you to know that i'm standing in a wilderness today and I believe that at some point, all of us are in a wilderness. And that's part of the reason why um, we were so excited when God laid this study on our hearts was because um, we find ourselves in these wilderness places so often. And um, I really want us to focus, particularly tonight, in honing in on who God is. <coughs> because he shows us himself in ways that we wouldn't otherwise see when we are in the wilderness. Um, I typically would read the whole passage, um, but since y'all have already studied through it, um, we're going to go verse by verse through. And um, I also just wanted, before we do this, because we're talking about the Red Sea tonight, um, each of you, last week you got a map, or there's a map either in your Bible, there's the one that we have on our website where you can download. Um, this is what we would consider the most popular theory on where they crossed the Red Sea. Um, there are other theories out there, and I've researched a bunch of them, but this is um, one of the ones that I have found to be the most mainstream kind of thoughts on where they crossed the Red Sea. So as we go through um, and as we're looking at this, I, don't, um, I want us to be open with knowing that we don't have all the answers, and that's okay. And there's, um, I imagine, this week left a lot of questions because there's some hard things in this one. So um, we are going to jump right in. So we're going to start in verse 1, then the Lord of uh, chapter 14. Then the Lord said to Moses, tell the people of Israel to turn back and encamp in front of by Herod's Roth, <clears throat> between Migdal and the sea, in front of Baal Zephon. You shall encamp facing it by the sea. Um, God has turned them back to a place, um, and he's asked them, um, particularly, I get this in the ESV version, that he's asking them to face toward the sea, but he's asking them to, to face what seems like not the right way, because they're surrounded by mountains, and so it feels weird that they would turn and face water, but that is what God very clearly states in here. And when we see details like this in scripture, we want to perk up our antennas and go, okay, that they're very clearly telling us he's facing a certain way. So what does he have to teach us in that? So um, where we look affects what we see. And I know that sounds like 
duh, Aaron, I know that. Like, if I'm looking at Debbie's face, I see Debbie's face. But if I turn and look at this banner, I see the banner. But where we look affects what we see. And so when God tells us to look in a certain direction, we need to pay attention to that. Um, all right, so let's go keep going. Verse 3. For Pharaoh will say of the people of Israel, they are wandering in the land. The wilderness has shut them in. I will harden Pharaoh's heart, and he will pursue them, and I will get the glory over Pharaoh and all his hosts, and the Egyptians shall know that I am Lord. And they did so. So Pharaoh is going to see that they are um, hemmed in in the land, that they, the wilderness has shut, the in, shut them in. Where they are on the map, they are completely surrounded by wilderness. There's nowhere to go. And so to Pharaoh, this looks ridiculous because he's, he sees these people that are in the middle of nowhere with nowhere to go, and they look like sitting ducks. And so what happens um, coming up in the next verse we're going to see is exactly what God tells them is going to happen. Our enemy sees our wilderness circumstances and believes that that is, um, makes us susceptible to attack. Because our enemy sees where we are and thinks, Psh, you're a sitting duck. I got you. But what does God say? God says that he is going to get the glory over Pharaoh and all of his hosts and Egypt. The Egyptians shall know that I am Lord. God sees this as a place to display his glory. And this is a place, and Stacy mentioned this last week, that um, she's been chasing the word glory through scripture. Um, that, and when we're coming to scripture, there are... Um, there are times where we can just we can see a word and we can start to every time we see that word in scripture it should it should like wake our attention up and go oh like so glory is one of those words we're going to continue to see over the course of this study and we should look it should perk up our attention to that word and go oh what is god trying to do here what is his glory what how does he display his glory what is the purpose of his glory and all that so i want us to keep that in mind as we are going through because while our enemy sees our wilderness as a place to attack our god sees our wilderness as a place to display his glory um, our enemy may see us as hemmed in by the desert but we know that we are hemmed in by god Psalm 139.5 says, You hem me in behind and before, and you lay your hand upon me. So while it looks like we are in a desolate place with nowhere to go, we have a God who has surrounded us, and we have a God who is with us, and he has hemmed us in. So whatever your enemy is, whatever the um, thing that enslaved you, the thing that you're trying to get away from, um, I spoke about this at a door a couple weeks ago when I was talking out of Isaiah chapter 30 and my word for the year, it was 700 years later and they're still trying to go back to Egypt. And we talked about what are our idols? What are the things we continue to go to instead of going to God? And so no matter what it is that God is doing in our life, trying to remove the idols from us and trying to help us into that wilderness, um, we know that our God is more powerful because he can display his glory um, he has the power to defeat the enemy in our life and um, even it, when we are in the wilderness place God purposely led them there remember we talked about that last week in chapter 13 it says that he led them by the way of the wilderness and so God has a purpose in leading them here and we're going to get to see why he led them to this spot in this chapter so picking up in verse 5 when the king of Egypt was told that the people had fled, the mind of Pharaoh and his servants was changed toward the people, and they said, What is this we have done that we have let Israel go from serving us? So he made ready his chariots and took with him his army, and he took 600 chosen chariots and all the other chariots of Egypt with officers over all of them. And the Lord hardened the heart of Pharaoh, king of Egypt, and he pursued the people of Israel while the people of Israel were going out defiantly. 
the Egyptians pursued them, all of Pharaoh's horses and chariots, his horsemen, his army, and overtook them and camped by the sea at that really hard word to say, <laughs> in front of Baal Zephon. <laughs> okay, so Pharaoh wakes up and he goes, okay, whoops, didn't mean to do that. How many people, do you remember last week, how many people did we say the conservative estimate is? Two million. Two million, okay? So some estimates even put it as high as three million. So all of a sudden, he, he wakes up and realizes two to three million of his workforce are gone, and uh, nothing's going to get done. He's like, whoops, forgot about that. We need to go take care of that. So he takes 600 chosen chariots, all his chariots, and I love how Moses goes into such detail about the vastness of what, of what Pharaoh did. Pharaoh knew if I'm going to get two million people to turn around and come back to me, I'm going to need a lot of armor and a lot of people, soldiers. And so he takes with him as many people as he can and as many of his chariots to go after them. Um, all right, so picking up in verse 10. When Pharaoh drew near, the people of Israel lifted their eyes, and behold, the Egyptians were marching after them, and they feared greatly. And the people of Israel cried out to the Lord, and they said to Moses, Is this because there are no graves in Egypt that you have taken us away to die in the wilderness? What have you done in bringing us out of Egypt? Is not this what we said to you in Egypt? Leave us alone that we may serve the Egyptians, for it would have been better to serve the Egyptians than to die in the wilderness. I can't imagine the rumbling that they must have heard. Down by the sea, you know, they're down by the sea, and so around them is wilderness and mountains, and so to have this massive army all of a sudden come. And what did they do? It says that they lifted their eyes and they feared greatly. Because where we look affects what we see, and it affects how we feel. And truthfully, our feelings get us in trouble. Yeah. Lisa Turkers puts it this way. She says, we steer where we stare. We steer where we stare. Where we look affects what we see, and it affects how we feel. God asks them to face what? the sea and he asked them to face forward what was forward what was in front of what was go moving before them a pillar of fire a pillar of fire and a pillar of cloud the presence of god himself he was saying look at me don't look at my en your enemy and what happened when they heard the rumbling they immediately they took their eyes off of god and they turned around and locked eyes on their enemy mm -hmm. and they were filled with fear they had the physical presence of God with them. And then they cried out to God, but it says they cried out to Moses, why did you bring me here? He said they would rather serve the Egyptians than die in the wilderness. They would rather be enslaved than to live in the wilderness in the presence of our God. And they start complaining and saying, why are we going through this? And da da da. And I think we do that a lot where we take our eyes off of God and we put it on our circumstances we look at our idols and we look at our enemies and we look at the things that used to enslave us and we're filled with fear and then we start to question Hebrews 2 1 I quote this verse a lot because it's just been one of my favorite verses, and I can, God uses it in almost every time I'm speaking or, or studying. It says, therefore, we must pay much closer attention to what we have heard, lest we drift away from it. And the Greek word for uh, must pay much closer attention means to turn your mind to. So we literally have to turn our minds. We have to turn around from whatever it is that we are drifting towards or looking at or taking our eyes off of God and turn our minds toward what we have heard. We have to know what is true of our God. Because in the moment when our feelings start to take over and our fears start to well up, we need to have something solid that we can remember at a moment's <coughs> notice. 
to turn our mind back to what we have heard and remember that. Priscilla Shire in her book Fervent says, we don't see the full picture, we only see the difficulty. We can't always see what God has. Prayer is what opens our eyes. In verse 11, they are crying out to who? Moses. They're crying out to Moses. And they're complaining to him. And instead of asking God, what is it that you have for us in this? Prayer is just talking to God. And so in these moments where our first ten natural tendency is to pick up the phone and call our best friend, even though she's going to be 12 hours ahead of me, <laughs> it's going to be hard. So, like, what is our natural tendency? Is it to call our best friend? Is it to call our mom? Is it to, or is it to go to God first and ask him? So, let's keep going. Okay. And Moses said to the people, fear not, stand firm, and see the salvation of the Lord, which he will work for you today. For the Egyptians who you see today, you shall never see again. The Lord will fight for you. You only, you have only to be silent. So Moses says, fear not, don't be afraid, stand firm, don't go back, don't give in. The Egyptians you see today, you're never going to see again. Now this verse that is in here, we are quoted a lot. The Lord will fight for you. You need to only be silent. The Lord will fight for you. You only need to be still. Um, this is a really good point to talk about the difference in translations. Um, there are multiple different translations of the Bible. And you'll notice in your notes, I kind of guide you through when to look at what type of translation. So there are translations that are literal translations where they actually take the Hebrew, which is the original language of the Old Testament, and the Greek, which is the original language that the New Testament is written in, and they literally translate from the original text. The ESV is one of those. Um, I believe King James is one of is like that as well, right? Stacy, was I okay? King James. Yeah, I believe they are. Um, so then there are translations on the other side that are called paraphrase. That's what the message, the voice, those are paraphrase translations. Um, paraphrase translations are where they take the, uh, what has been written in English and they kind of interpret the intended meaning and write it into today's vernacular. And so paraphrase, while has a, a place in Bible study, um, it needs to be treated as commentary because it is someone else's interpretation of what the scripture said. So that's why in your study notes, it'll tell you not to go to the message or the voice until later in the week, until you've had time to sit with the, with the text um, as, as it is a little bit closer to the original language first before you start getting into some interpretation. So in the middle, there are some that are kind of a combination of both. Um, one of the really popular ones right now is called the Christian Standard Bible. Um, that's what the She Reads Truth Bible, that's what LifeWay uses, so um, it's a little bit of both. So you'll get a little bit of the paraphrase kind of intended meaning, and you'll get a little bit of like the actual literal translation. So um, this is one of those verses that when you read it in multiple translations, you will notice there are different words. How many of your Bibles say that actually says be still? All right, and some of y'all say silent. Does anyone else have a different word? Be quiet. Okay. So it's really important to, to, with some of these, this is why I want you reading it in the ESV first, because the ESV is very similar. To, it says be um, silent. Because what Moses is really, the actual Hebrew word means to be quiet or to be silent. And so when we see the word be still, it sends a different signal than what be silent means. He's actually saying, shut up. <laughs> Stop complaining. <clears throat> God has a plan, but you're not going to hear it if you're just complaining. And so when we, we often quote this verse and go, God's going to fight for me. I'm just going to sit right here and be still. And that's not at all what this means. He's saying, 
Stop complaining to the people around you. Stop going to your leadership and complaining. Stop going to your sister, to your mom, to your best friend and complaining about what's going on. Be quiet before God and give him a chance to speak. Because what happens in the next verse is exactly, it's my favorite part. The Lord says to Moses, why do you cry out to me? Tell the people of Israel to go forward. Lift up your staff, stretch out your hand over the sea and divide it that the people of Israel may go through the sea on dry ground. I will harden the hearts of the Egyptians so that they will go in after them and I will get the glory over Pharaoh and all of his hosts, his chariots and his horsemen that the Egyptians shall know that I am the Lord and when I have gotten glory over Pharaoh, his chariots and his horsemen. God says, why are you crying out to me? Go forward. And so we need to, we can't hear his instructions if we're complaining. And we're not called to just sit and watch God's salvation. That wasn't his plan. His plan was not that they just sit on the shore of the wilderness and wait for him to do something with the Egyptians. His plan for their salvation meant they actually had to step forward in obedience in the path that he was going to prepare for them. And so the same is for us. When we are looking at our life and we are, we are in that wilderness place and we are sitting there, we need to look forward and go, okay, God, what do you want me to do? Do I need to just sit still? Because that might be his will. That might be what he wants in that moment. But he might have a step of obedience that we need to take. Um, I, to me, I, was, I liken this to if if we could just sit still and his salvation would happen, none of us would have to accept Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior because his death on the cross would have been enough. But it takes a step of obedience and a step of faith for us to actually walk in the salvation that he has prepared for us. And so we have to ask ourselves, what is there a place in our life where we are continuing to cry out to God and he's asking us to move forward? And then he continues on, and he, he does this repetition. And this is, um, the more you study the first five books of the Old Testament, that these are the books that Moses wrote, you'll notice some repetition in there, and he continues. Um, part of that is they didn't have scrolls, and people weren't reading this. They were telling it orally. And so the way that God's word was passed from person to person to person was that they were telling him and quoting the scripture to them. And... It's a lot easier to memorize things when there's repetition. And these are points, again, that he's continuing to try and, and point out. Like, I'm getting the glory here. I'm going to get the glory here. I'm going to get the glory here. Then the angel of God, verse 19, who was going before the host of Israel, moved and went behind them. And the pillar of cloud moved before them and stood behind them coming between the host of Egypt and the host of Israel, and there was a cloud and the darkness, and it lit up the night without one coming near each other all night. Okay, so did anybody happen to read the message version? Okay, so I love how the message put this. Okay, so the pillar of cloud has been before them, and what does the pillar of cloud do now? It moves behind them, and it goes between them and their enemy. And this is how the message describes it. The cloud enshrouded one camp in darkness, and it flooded the other with light. So it covered their enemy in complete darkness so that they couldn't see where to go. They, they were stuck. And he completely flooded the Israelites' camp with light. And so what did he just do? He separated darkness from light. Right? So Put a, yeah, they right. They couldn't look back and see their enemy anymore. He said, no, remember, I told you, look forward. <laughs> Go forward. So he physically put something behind them that keeps them from looking back, mm -hmm. right? And then okay. keep that light from darkness in your mind because we're going to dig into that a little bit more, okay? Um, so verse 21, then Moses stretched out his hand over the sea, and the Lord drove back the sea by a strong east wind, all night and made the sea dry ground and the waters were divided and the people of Israel went into the midst of the sea on dry ground the waters being a wall to them on their right and on their left 
One of the things that's really important to know about the Israelites is that they're desert dwellers. Try saying that five times fast. (laughs) It is so hard. Desert dwellers. They were scared of water. And there's a lot of mystic things in the culture around water. There's water gods and there was fear over water. And so not only do they have their enemy behind them, they have one of their fears in front of them. And I couldn't really find a lot of information about the shallowest part. I kept Googling shallowest part of the Red Sea and it kept telling me the Red Sea at its deepest. And I was like, that's not the shallowest. Um, But at the deepest, the Red Sea is about 17, I wanna say it's like 17,000 feet, okay? At its shallowest, the best I could find, tell, was it's about 100 feet at at the, you know, like obviously at the shore it's not 100 feet, but you know what I mean. Okay, so even if it's at the shallowest, that's 10 stories of water that are beside them. It's like, I mean, I just picturing walking downtown and thinking of 10 story buildings as water. And we look at, you know, we, I love the movies. I love them, you know, Prince of Egypt, it's a great movie. But it paints this picture of like 30 feet of water and 30 feet of water and like the short little thing. And it, it, really honestly could have been like walking through two skyscrapers of water. And what is so amazing to me, y'all, is that it is God's spirit that is holding the water back. Mm-hmm. The, the Hebrew word ruach, which is also fun to say, um, <laughs> it's often translated wind in the Bible, but in the Old Testament, but there are places where it very specifically references the spirit of God. And God's ruach um, is, when it relates to the spirit of God, it's the third person of God that inspires prophecy, imparts warlike energy, and endows men with various gifts, and it's the energy of life. It is the personal presence of God. And so God puts himself behind them, and now he has put himself holding back water before them, He has completely hemmed them in with his presence. And his spirit that is what is hovering over the chaos of creation. It caused floodwaters to recede. It was on Joseph as he interpreted dreams. It was on Pharaoh when he, or on Moses when he stood before Pharaoh. It was on Bezalel, who's the first artist who built the tabernacle. It stirred the people to generosity um, in Exodus 35. It was on Joshua um, as he led people into the promised land. It's used over and over and over, and it is the life that is breathed into us. And that is what is holding back the waters of the Red Sea. Um, And Stacy mentioned last week, Max Anders wrote this book called 30 Days to Understanding Your Bible, and she sent me this quote, and I just loved it. So, when they lined up to cross the Red Sea, it was more than a little aisle that would have been required, because if they crossed the Red Sea a hundred abreast, counting animals, the column backwards would have stretched as far as 15 miles into the desert. So, even at the, at the narrowest of thought that they were a hundred abreast. It's so much more than like this little 30 foot aisle we think of of 10 feet of water. He didn't just like make a little clearing. (laughs) Y'all, he like parted the Red Sea and he held back with his own spirit. And then they walked on dry land. There was no mud or muck for them to slow them down. Y'all, There was no remnant of their fear weighing them down as they walked through. Mm -hmm. They were walking through on dry land. So we see him separate light and dark. We see his spirit hovering over the waters and we see waters part to reveal dry land. Does that sound like anything else we've heard? Another story? Genesis 1. It is his spirit. We have a creation story here reflected again. 
gives me just Oh, I love this chapter. Okay, so let's read on 24. And in the morning watch, the Lord in the pillar of fire and of cloud looked down on the Egyptian forces and threw the Egyptian forces into a panic, clogging their chariot wheels so that they drove heavily. And the Egyptians said, let us flee from before Israel, for the Lord fights for them against the Egyptians. Y'all, I, re- like, I wonder what that looked like. That the pillar of cloud and the pillar of fire in the middle of a parted Red Sea looked down at them and go, they go, oh no, that guy is fighting for them and we got to get out of here. He looked down at them and they were filled with fear and they knew who God was. Then the Lord said to Moses, stretch out your hand over the sea and the water may come back upon the Egyptians, upon their chariots, upon their horsemen. So Moses stretched out his hand over the sea and the sea returned to its normal course when the morning appeared. And as the Egyptians fled into it, the Lord threw the Egyptians into the midst of the sea. The water returned and covered the chariots and the horsemen and all of the hosts of Pharaoh that had followed them into the sea. Not one of them remained. But the people of Israel walked on dry land through the sea, the waters being a wall to them on their right and on their left. And thus the Lord saved Israel that day from the hand of the Egyptians. The Israelite, and Israel saw the Egyptians dead on the seashore. Israel saw the great power that the Lord used against the Egyptians. So the people feared the Lord, and they believed in the Lord and in his servant Moses. God had never led them to a wilderness, they would have missed the miracle of the Red Sea. And while I hate being in the wilderness, I cannot deny that God does things in our life to show his power, to show that he is has great power over my enemy, he has great power over my fear, and that he has the ability to create something miraculous that no one else has ever seen because he took me to a wilderness. I don't want to miss what it is that he has. So what questions do we ask ourselves after this? Who, um, where we look affects what we see. So are you looking at God or are you looking at your circumstances? Who are you talking to? Are you giving God a chance to talk or are you complaining to others? And who is God? Um, My hope is that by tomorrow on the website we will have posted um, two new documents. One will be names of God and one will be characteristics of God. And each week, at the end of the week, I want y'all to look at these lists. And I and, and they don't have to be from those lists. So if God reveals something else to you, if the Holy Spirit says, I see me this way, we want to come to God's word and see who God is before we come and say, what did you want me to do about it? And so I want us pulling out these characteristics of who God is. And so when we um, study this week, you'll have those two sheets to be able to start kind of looking like where do we see these characteristics of who God is because if we can remember who God is then when our eyes catch our greatest fear or our enemies or our circumstances we can turn our mind to who he truly is in our circumstances um so for me um he is El Elyon which means that he is God Almighty um and for uh, me, his, it's the name, I believe you say El Roy, which every time I say that, I say <laughs> his boy, El Roy. <laughs> um, <laughs> little Jetsons. Okay, so um, El Roy means that he's the God who sees me. He sees your circumstances. He knows you. And I've studied in Psalm 139, and so if y'all um, this week, And that's one of the key things I took away, and I see it in this story. He's the God who sees us. Um, So as y'all go through this week, ask yourselves, um, are you looking at God or your circumstances? Who are you talking to about it? And who is God?